Uh, hello and welcome. This is uh, Oxfam plus Drupal equal great. My name is Matt Cheney. This is Joe Baker. And we're here to talk to you today about how an organization like Oxfam uses Drupal to do a better job with the work that it does, to talk about some of the experiences we've had, and to showcase some of the work that was done and give people a good idea of what sort of Drupal and nonprofit NGO uh, stuff looks like. So a quick show of hands to get us started. How many people here either like, work for an NGO or nonprofit or do work with them? Focus, perfect, all right, you are absolutely in the right place, and I hope that you get a lot out of sort of today's session. We're, um, as the, the only session actually at the conference that's about like social justice and nonprofit NGO work, um, we're gonna talk a little bit sort of in the abstract about how Drupal and nonprofit and NGO stuff works together, um, and then really dive into some of, the, some of the details around all that. So we'll save some time for questions at the end as well, but if something's really you know, on your mind, just, just blurt it out. Then sort of by way of introductions, um, as I mentioned, um, this is me before I got facial hair. Um, my name is Matt Cheney. I actually, I don't work at Oxfam, um, unfortunately, but I do work uh, in San Francisco for a company called Chapter 3. Um, we do a lot of nonprofit and NGO work um, for a lot of different organizations around the world um, and really sort of have made that a core part of our business and, and the way we sort of think about, think about things um, ever since we started in 2006. Um, Oxfam is one of my favorite organizations just personally, so working with, with, uh, with Joe and the rest of the team was a really rewarding and excellent experience. Um, and it was something that like, I think was really sort of really what I set out to do in Drupal. Um, when I started Chapter 3 with, with Josh, who's back here, and Zach Rosen, we actually sat around at a table and we, we talked about sort of why are we starting this company. So it was like 2006, so it's a, a while ago. And one of the things I had mentioned at that time was that I really loved Oxfam and I really wanted to work on like a web development project with them to help them do their work better. So sort of as DrupalCon Paris, there was a RFP for a project came out and I sort of you know, got involved there and it's been a really good time and a good experience working with, with everyone at Oxfam on, on their projects we did. And it's sort of our privilege to share with you some of those experiences today. So that's who I am. I love Drupal, I love Oxfam, and I'm happy to talk to you all about it. Hi, I'm Joe. Uh, I work for Oxfam which is my privilege. I, I really enjoy it. It's a great place to work. And two of my colleagues are actually here. Uh, Gabrielle, who I work with day to day uh, in the office in Oxford, and um, Robert, who works for Oxfam Germany in Berlin, is also here. I didn't know Robert was going to be here, so it's a great, great thrill for me to see him here as well. Um, I was a freelance Drupal developer for years. I first touched Drupal on version 4.4, which was years ago. I, I can't remember what year it was, 2004 or something like that. And I've, I've, I've been working with it really kind of um, overtly since 4.6 and, and uh, I was freelance quite a while and then I saw just on the off chance that um, the job for uh, uh, as developer at Oxfam International came up and thought actually I haven't done an interview for quite a while I'll go and do an interview to see if I can still do interviews and they offered me the job and took it on as a one-year project and I, I've been there ever since I've been there three years now and I uh, really enjoy working it's an amazing uh, privilege to wake up every morning and use my skills which are no use in the field out there uh, in disaster relief or um, development, um, in no use at all out there, but I still I'm able to use my skills to make the world a better place, uh, which is really great. Excellent. And for today's talk, we're going to uh, start off talking a little bit about sort of how Drupal can work for good, and definitely sort of a source of personal motivation for Joe and I around a lot of the work we do. And then we're going to get into some specifics and sort of how the anatomy of an NGO would break down, really give you a good overview of, of, of what Oxfam is, the kinds of work that they do, and sort of you know, what kinds of problems they're trying to solve and how technology can help. And then we're going to spend the bulk of our time going through really three very good examples of how Oxfam has used Drupal. First in their public website, Oxfam.org, to help to, to do all the wonderful things it does there on the blogs at Oxfam.org site to coordinate a lot of different voices and get a lot of different messaging out. And then on the, uh, the Oxfam International Internet, which is a project I worked on that helps to co coordinate sort of the work internally at Oxfam um, between the 6,000 or so folks who work, who work across the Confederacy. And then we'll spend some time at the end sort of talking about some of the sort of developer tricks and some of the sort of technical bits that went into the projects. Um, since it's DrupalCon, we'll show a little code and talk about modules, but uh, that's something we'll probably sort of get into more detail um, if people want sort of in Q&A or, or after the session. But in general, talk about Oxfam, what it does, how it uses Drupal, and how nonprofits or NGOs that you might work with could sort of use some of those lessons to, to do the same. So stick it up, as I mentioned, let's talk about making the world a better place, uh, make it how a place we want to live, and show how we can do it with code. 
Um, this is a sort of interesting problem for people, I think, who come into technology because unlike a lot of the work that Oxfam would do or other nonprofits would do, this very hands-on, very direct, you can work with people, you help. Writing little ones and zeros in your computer has a sort of you know disconnected uh, sort of sort of space from the actual good that you do, and it requires a little bit of sort of you know creative thinking and planning to understand how can I use something like a CMS, a pile of scripts in PHP, to actually affect the kind of social change that we want. Um, it's definitely a little impersonal sometimes to write code, but I think as we'll demonstrate, you know, the more code that you write and the more specifically you know useful that code is, the the stronger it'll help organizations. Uh, a B, and that's really what drives a lot of the work that, that I do. And I think this is sort of how um, Drupal will, will save the world. So this is a blog post Jeff Robbins wrote in 2007. It's still timely today. Um, it's uh, very interesting because his sort of crux of this thing is uh, communication. That the number one reason why sort of something like Drupal is helpful to organizations is it allows them to communicate the work that they do, the messaging, the campaigns, the fundraising appeals, and the information out to the rest of the world. That this is true for a large organization like Oxfam that has a lot of different campaigns and, and it is involved in a lot of different projects. But this is also true with sort of very small examples, a small group of people trying to highlight an injustice, uh, a maybe organizing group trying to recruit more members to sort of you know, make a change in their community, or any number of other things in between. And that, that's sort of really telling because when you can take somebody Drupal that right now does need a lot of sort of code and, and glue code and, and real custom config to get working. If you sort of take the vision that's just putting out there and, and things that Joe and I would believe that if we can make Drupal more useful and more end sort of user focused and easier, it sort of reduces the barrier to entry for organizations to communicate. And I think that's really where I come down with technology in that we can build something as a Drupal CMS that lets people sort of talk about their ideas and really push them out there without the need to write a lot of code and to have that kind of open source free experience. Um, and I think that's something that is sort of part of the culture of Drupal um, to sort of make these kinds of tools for people. I think it's uh, honestly some of the reasons that people got into Drupal in the first place. Um, and definitely it's sort of part of the history of Drupal. Um, Drupal, one of the early industries that Drupal did really well in back in 2004, 2005, uh, was the nonprofit space. Um, they have a lot of unique needs um, and cost and you know, flexibility is, is sort, of, sort of some of those. And that drove a lot of people to sort of see and adopt Drupal. Um, my friends Neil and Z Neil Drum, and Zach Rosen started the first Drupal company. It was a nonprofit focused company that would make a distribution of Drupal uh, called Civic Space that a lot of organizations use. Um, at a point, sort of 2005, it was actually, uh, in some cases, even more well known than Drupal was. Like people would ask for Civic Space as a thing because they were a nonprofit and they had heard it solves nonprofit problems. And then I think there's sort of been stuff ever since that really sort of caps a bit, caps eyes on that kind of interest. Um, and nonprofits have been some of the biggest Drupal sites are nonprofit sites. There's a lot of people who work professionally in Drupal that only work on nonprofit sites, and I think it's part of part of the part of the history, um, and the, and the future as well. I also think there's something that Joe and I were talking sort of earlier today about how Drupal really I think attracts some of these people. That the aspect of an open source community like ours, it's really about sharing, collaboration, and sort of helping other people. And that I think the people who are drawn to Drupal as an open source project are also drawn to working with organizations that have similar missions. And so there's this sort of really virtuous cycle where people are, they're interested in sharing collaborations, they get involved in Drupal, they then decide to share and collaborate with people in the nonprofit space and sort of you know, feel, you know, feel good and do good about that. And then they come back in Drupal and contribute more code. And it really becomes a pretty good, good place. There's a website, uh, Drupal for Good, on groups.drupal.org, where a lot of people will talk about their experiences and share code and you know, help and, and have that kind of, kind of interaction. Um, and definitely check that out if you're interested in sort of how, how a Drupal can work with nonprofits or NGOs. Um, because at the end of the day, Drupal plus nonprofits equal great for a lot of different reasons. Um, obviously, the community, as I mentioned, is really helpful. If you're a nonprofit and you want to hire someone in Drupal, it's a lot actually probably easier to do that than it is if you're a, a different kind of business. If you want to have an extendable, powerful site that you can use to do whatever, um, Drupal's a really good solution. And uh, the, the cost, especially free for the open source stuff, is, is, really, is really attractive to a lot of organizations. You can get going quickly, you can iterate quickly, and you can take advantage of the sort of experience and genius of a lot of people that came before you. Um, and I think that's sort of, you know, sort of part of why we sort of see Drupal and nonprofits as working really well together, and definitely some of the reasons that, that Oxfam and other organizations have chosen it. Um, so I'll turn it over to Joe now to sort of talk about more specifically sort of what an NGO, how it works, and specifically sort of Oxfam and how they structure their, their organization um, as we sort of dive into some of the details. 
Thanks, Matt. So um, I'm aware from the hands up earlier on that actually a lot of you are from NGOs or work with NGOs, but I th we both thought it'd be useful really to talk particularly about you know what an NGO is, why it exists, and particularly in my experience here uh, at Oxfam. Um, but aware that just by talking about Oxfam doesn't mean I'm talking about all NGOs. No NGO is like another. Every, th every NGO has a different structure, different format, different agenda. Even if it's um, kind of basically doing the same thing, uh, there's no hard and fast rules um, to say this is an NGO. Oxfam, uh, as an organisation, has existed since about the 50s. We um, work together, uh, we work in 98 countries around the world, uh, and our agenda is to uh, work for a just world without poverty. Uh, we are, as an organisation, outraged by um, the, the persistence of poverty in the world and the injustice which, uh, which follows it up, uh, which keeps it in place. Uh, and we believe that this must and, and can be overcome uh, if we work hard enough. Um, the unjust policies uh, and practices that exist at local, national and international levels can, can and must all be challenged and um, people's rights must be respected in this process. Uh, and so we're committed as an organization to strengthening um, especially uh, citizens' movements across the world um, to work together towards um, economic and social justice. And, and one of the ways that Oxfam does this, and, and this is very common in, in many NGOs, is that we do this um, particularly through partnership. We try and find um, indigenous, native um, organizations, people who are already working on the ground, and work with them, find out ways, rather than coming in as a sort of imperial, wealthy, Western uh, organization with all the great ideas, we try and find people who already understand the situation and work with them and find ways in which we can join together. Um, many people, when they think of Oxfam, they think of one organization, but actually we're 15 uh, and more separate organizations. Uh, people, especially in Britain, don't, don't see this, and I, and I don't know um, so well about the, um, how Oxfam has been in other parts of the world. But certainly in Britain, we, you know, we have Oxfam bookshops and, um, and uh, so on all around the, the country, and everyone sees Oxfam the organi organization, but actually we're, we are separate, 15 separate organizations here. Um, most of those member organizations are national size, so you can see the 15 of them there. The only exception being Canada, uh, where they have two organizations, Oxfam Canada and Oxfam Quebec, uh, alongside each other. We have a couple of um, observer organizations, organizations who are uh, observing Oxfam as an organization as a whole and, and working out whether they really want to be committed to be part of the, this larger confederation. The result of this is that actually these 15 organizations are separate, legally, financially separate from each other. They're able to de determine their own um, structures, um, their own methods of working, all within, of course, the, con the confines of being members of the confederation. And then there's this one little bit um, called Oxfam International, which is what I work for, um, that is supposed to try and join all these 15 separate Oxfams together and help them have one way of talking, um, one way of delivering um, our work uh, at large. Um, Ox um, Amnesty International is an organization that many people will know. Amnesty International is kind of inverted in size from us. Amnesty International is huge by comparison with the, nas the national bits of, Ox of uh, Amnesty. Amnesty Great Britain, Amnesty America, and so on are small. And so Amnesty International is able to be much more executive in um, making the organization run as a whole. Oxfam International is tiny, we're very, very small, and so we can't be executive, we can't say this is the way to do things. We have to do things through collaboration, through uh, convincing and persuading. And that is, in effect, the way that Oxfam works in the field. We, we try and find people that we can work with together in, in collaboration through convincing and, and persuading um, and working together. You can see where we're going with the Drupal world, can't you? Similar kind of terms. Um, because Oxfam is 15 plus organizations, we, we do kind of what Dries was talking about in the keynote today. We have lots of different technologies that every organization uses something different. Um, and certainly, just quickly trying to look, look around uh, the different Oxfam websites, all of these are, are active in different places. Oxfam America uses Plone. Oxfam France uses this one called SPIP, which I'd never heard of before. Um, Oxfam Great Britain, the biggest part of, uh, of Oxfam, actually do everything pretty much by hand with Dreamweaver, if you can believe that. Um, and there's some custom PHP out there. 
Uh, and then there's a few Oxfams which are now starting to use Drupal quite a bit more. Oxfam International was the first, pretty much. Oxfam Germany are now using Drupal. Quebec and Canada are both using it, and um, Oxfam in Spain is also moving that direction. Um, I think they are using this smart site Experian, I think. Yeah, I think it's either them or Australia who are using it. I think. <laughs> Um, but at Oxfam International, we love Drupal. We think Drupal's great for many of the reasons, really, that Dries talked about earlier on. It allows us to sort of homogenize a very disparate set of, of um, ways of communicating uh, and having it delivered through one system, one method, one approach, one, one thing that we have to update, maintain, and so on and so forth. It simplifies the whole process and makes it much, much easier for us to, uh, to, to deliver it. And of course, the values that underpin the Drupal community are very, very similar to the values that underpin um, Oxfam as, as an organization. So it's a really, really good fit. So we're going to talk uh, for the next uh, few minutes about three sort of key examples of how Oxfam as a, uh, an organization, as an NGO, uses um, Drupal. I'm going to talk about the international website, the public website, oxfam.org about the blog site, and Matt will talk about the internet. So the public website um, really is the, uh, the front door to the organization. It's the way in which we do what Jeff Robbins was talking about. It's the way in which we communicate um, what's really happening out there in the, in the, the disaster zones, uh, in the places which are in desperate need of development. Um, we use the site to talk about the most pressing issues um, which we are addressing as an organization. Um, talk about how Oxfam is responding to um, these pressing issues and especially talk about how people can get engaged with them themselves, uh, about what you can do as individuals and as, as groups. Um, Oxfam International is not allowed to raise its own money. It's one of the, one of the um, important factors for us. Uh, is that we don't build a constituency. We're not allowed to um, take away from the potential that, um, uh, for reaching um, um, the general public that the national Oxfams can use. And so we, uh, we're not allowed to, to raise any money. We're not allowed to build a constituency. And so th the website also exists as a form of signposting, trying to push um, p users uh, fr um, of the website towards their local or national Oxfams. Um, and uh, yes, so the website does three really key things. Uh, it, get, it talks about our message. Um, it gets the message out, particularly in terms of emergencies uh, and crises, um, what's going on. Uh, it gives breaking news as the emergencies occur. Um, once the emergency has developed and we're starting to really understand what the issues are, then we are able to, s to start building in lots of background information. Um, and Finally, we start to add in um, elements of real human stories of what people are actually experiencing and how they're struggling to survive in these um, really difficult situations. For us, doing this with, uh, with Drupal is, is really, really easy. It's um, got some excellent tools that we, uh, we use all the time, views, image cache, um, no queue, and that sort of thing, to make sure that the most up-to-date, the most vital information is always, always being bubbled up to the top to the top of the, the emergency section of the site, to the, the top of the home page, um, and the most important information is always being pushed out. We're also able to do quite a lot of you know, funkier things in this um, area of the site with uh, videos, with lots of custom JavaScript to make galleries and, and so on to communicate the story um, of what's going on in these, these various situations. Uh, we're also able to talk about our mission. You know, obviously, we don't want to have to keep responding to crises. We don't want uh, all these terrible things to happen, and so we want uh, we work very, very hard on development um, underneath it all. Um, we engage in, in all kinds of projects uh, all around the world, um, particularly trying to partner with, as I said before, local organisations um, on the ground who understand the situations far better than we do um, in the developed world. Um, this section of the site works in a very similar way. Uh, we're using lots of views and, and image cache sort of stuff, but we, um, we try and give it a, a very uh, focused uh, geographical context. So we use um, the locations module and um, the open layers uh, tools for mapping. 
Um, and then the third major aspect is about um, creating change in the way things happen. And so Oxfam as an organization uh, particip participates in lots of campaigns. Um, we have been doing this for ages using um, the same sort of tools, views, no queue, image cache, that sort of stuff in, in the Drupal world. Uh, but we're just in the process of m moving many of these campaigns over to sort of sites in their own right, uh, sub-sites within the larger site. And the way we're doing this uh, is using um, spaces, features, and, uh, and context modules. And the Grow campaign, which is this top one here, I'll talk about this in a few more details a bit later on. Uh, but the Grow campaign is the first uh, major campaign we're, we're dealing with in this, um, this way as a site within the, m the main site. And so if you go to oxfam.org slash grow, uh, if you English is your first language, um, then you'll be able to see um, that section of the site has its own visual identity. Um, and Justin here on the front page, uh, front, <laughs> front page, on the front row, uh, worked on that project with us. The final area of the site is all about activism, getting involved. And uh, there's many ways in which people get involved. Um, we want to engage people whichever way we can. You'd be surprised to know that uh, actually the, the most highly viewed page of the site on the Get Involved section is this one here, working with Oxfam. Almost double the views of the whole site, uh, of, of any other page, uh, are on our, our jobs page. But there's lots of other ways in which people can get involved. And so we, uh, we have ways in which people can get informed. We have lots of videos. Um, so you can see here we're synchronizing up with, with uh, data on YouTube. Uh, we run petitions. We're very active in many of the, the social networking sites, especially active on Twitter, uh, for which we're very proud, really, of um, being able to engage people. Um, we talk a lot about uh, events that are upcoming um, and uh, about ways in which people can volunteer. And so for this, we're very proud, really, of the way in which Drupal allows integration with uh, external tools. Uh, and we use that as much as we can uh, in the site. The second uh, site I want to talk about uh, that we run on Drupal is the blog site. So this is really a very simple site. It, it does one job, and it does it quite well, really. It was originally a, a WordPress blog run on WordPress.com, which is obviously not so good on the, the, the branding side of things. Um, so we moved it in-house into a, um, a, blog, uh, a Drupal blog pretty soon after I arrived uh, three years ago, um, doing really what uh, Dries was talking about this morning, as I said before, trying to bring up all of our um, uh, websites onto to one platform. Uh, the, the blog site does two jobs um, for us. One is that it gives a voice to the voiceless. We, one of the things we do very frequently is we, we allow people uh, who are working with in the field to, um, to talk about their experience, their life, what, what's going on, where they are. And so many of the blogs on there are stories um, of uh, people's own experiences. But we also try and make it a way in which the real human beings uh, inside the organization are able to talk as well. So we, we, we uh, make a big point of um, identifying each of the, the bloggers uh, on the site um, as well. And this allows the, you know, the site to, to, give to be a place of dialogue, a, a place of exchange, uh, a conversation of thoughts and ideas backwards and forwards. Um, one of the things we've, we've been able to do with all this is we've been able to uh, interact much more closely with the with social networking sites. Uh, so we've you may have seen in some of the screenshots we've uh, created a, um, a short URL service, ox.am. We're very fortunate that Armenia has a .am um, domain top level domain extension. So we um, have ox.am as our uh, URL shortening service. And the good old Jeff Robbins created the uh, short URL tool for Drupal. So we have a, our very own short URL um, website uh, to create our short URLs, which are then able to use um, all over the place, such as um, social web links. Um, and then the final thing just to say at this point is that um, in the public web stuff, we do everything in three languages, um, English, French, and Spanish are the languages that that we publish in. English is our business language, but, and so the internet is only in English, but the public web is all in three languages. Excellent. 
Um, so sort of, you know, Joe sort of reviewed the sort of two of the major public websites that help to communicate Oxfam's vision to the sort of the, the rest of the world. Um, I'm going to talk for a little bit around a private website, which is called Sumus, but it's it's really the sort of global internet for Oxfam. There's something like 6,000 people that are on it that sort of are across the Confederacy, and it's sort of designed to have a sort of you know connecting type of experience for everybody. Uh, people who work across the different geographies often tackle the same problems, and one of the major goals of the site was to figure out ways that they can share documents and, and communicate and get up to date with sort of best practices and what people are doing. Um, Drupal, as it turns out, is a pretty good tool for this kind of stuff, and there's a lot of features and functionality I'll show you that was relatively straightforward to build in Drupal, but has an enormously powerful impact on sort of organizational effectiveness and the ability to sort of, sort of work with other people. Um, the site itself is, uh, is, is pretty large at this point. It's got about 100,000 pieces of content, uh, a lot of documents, a lot of, a lot of news posts, forum posts, um, and a number of other things. And that all sort of, you know, is, is sort of parceled out depending on what category or kind of thing it is. But there's, there's a lot going on on the site. It uh, runs in the cloud, has a lot of um, smart logic behind it. And it's, uh, you know, really sort of sets out to say, how can we coordinate and amplify the, the sort of work that's already being done? So when I, we sort of got involved in this project um, almost two years ago now, we sort of came in, or I sort of came in and sort of worked with Joe and, and other people there to figure out sort of how is the organization currently structuring itself into small teams, into small groups, and to understand sort of what it would take to sort of add a little Drupal magic to it to make those, those kinds of processes better. Um, I think for a lot of people in this room who work with technology and nonprofits, you're acutely aware that nonprofits and NGOs have very particular ways they already do things. Um, it's very hard sometimes to change those things. You can sort of get to a certain point. Um, and I think one of the important sort of, sort of initial goals we had with this site was how do we sort of take what's already being done and, and figure out ways to make that better, as opposed to trying to just drop in a solution, say it's all this way now. So we identified a number of things for as part of the strategy process, like a focus on documents, for example, that became really important in the work that we did, or a desire to connect with other people, really important. And I would sort of say to sort of, in terms of sort of thinking through a project like this, one of the things that we found really helpful was the, the idea of prototyping. Um, Drupal, because it is so modular and extendable, it's relatively easy to sort of just drop in a module that does something relatively roughly and sort of see, is that going to work for your organization? So we spent at least the first three months of the project really just sort of coming up with ideas and doing tests. We spent a lot of time with Open Atrium, which is a great tool. I assume a number of people in this room are using it. Um, great collaboration tool, works really well for, for a bunch of use cases. Um, the Oxfam site, we initially started with Open Atrium with Prototype, realized quite quickly that there's a lot more complexity that, that, that they needed than Open Atrium provides, but really had the opportunity to try getting users on Open Atrium and applying more modules on top of that, really, to sort of see how things work. So you'll see stuff we'll talk about a little bit around sort of activity feeds and you know, sort of notifications. These are things where you can install the activity module or the notifications module and get a sort of out of the box experience that you can sort of start to see how will that help my organization. Um, but you know, we sort of spent about three months working through that. I had a lot of 7 a.m. phone calls because uh, I live in San Francisco with with uh, with um, uh, Ox uh, Oxford. Um, that was fun. <laughs> Um, but uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was good to sort of get that rolling, and I would say, as a Drupal project, Drupal makes it so easy to get things up and running quickly, you should spend a lot of time figuring out how to prototype and test things. Um, that ultimately, it's not about just building it the right way, it's about building it the way that would work for people, and so that was, that was certainly a goal. Um, as well as figuring out a design and, and some other sort of styles that still reflected the Oxfam brand and identity, but would work well for actual end users. So there's a lot of different elements you'll see, little drop down menus, see all buttons, um, and styled boxes that we use sort of consistently across the site that I think look good but also function well. And those went through the same sort of iteration process. Um, in terms of sort of getting into the features of the site, the, the sort of core of the internet site is it's a group system. It uses organic groups. It has uh, you know quite a few of these things that would range anything from a sort of like short-term team that would be put together to handle a particular crisis to sort of ongoing stakeholder organizations that sort of persist throughout sort of the organization. And that each of the groups really is sort of a central driving place for sort of communication and work. Um, Drupal has a great group system, uh, organic groups in Drupal 6, groups in um, Drupal 7, and that's something that I think also reflects the sort of team-based approach and collaboration approach that works really well at Oxfam. So, when we started off, the, some of the stuff that went on here that was relatively easy to do in Drupal 
is we, of course, because it's a group, you can join the group. So there's a member list uh, available for, for individual groups. You can see sort of who's a part of it and what their title and organization is. This sort of helps to get some of the connection stuff we'll talk about in a minute. But member lists were relatively easy to do here. There's a tab on all of the groups. You can see who the members are. There's also uh, a set of sort of permissions around each group. Some groups are private, some are public, some are uh, you know, sort of semi in, in, in both ways. And that was also really helpful because there's a lot of work sometimes that is, is of a confidential nature or, or a private nature. And having a system that will allow you to sort of have those permissions um, is really important. And Drupal is really good at this because you have a node access system in Drupal that is sort of you know, connecting the entire sort of framework together. So we can set it up so that a particular group, you can say this piece of content is available to the entire public and this one is private. And not only will that show up sort of appropriately in people's feeds, they will see public stuff, not private, but it'll also work if they share it, it'll also work on search, and it sort of all ties together. And I think that's a real good advantage of Drupal is that sort of access control system because everything sort of talks to it. And if you have use cases where some stuff needs to be private, some public, node access in Drupal is a it can be a little tricky to get set up right, but it's definitely powerful when you do. Um, and then sort of the, the bulk then of the rest of the stuff on the group sites is really features. It's, it's what kinds of things do people who want to have a group and have members of that group do. And so to sort of run through this kind of stuff, the, the sort of the biggest feature, I think that gets the most use just by frequency, is the notification system. Where if you're a member of a group, the assumption isn't that you're going to come to this website every day and check every one of your groups but that you're going to be able to manage your sort of queue of emails in a way that ma makes sense to you. So you can have a digest version or a daily version or a, uh, you know, a real-time version. But that if you're a member of a group and you've so decided to, you can say, I, get, I want an email for every new news post, I want an email for every new document, this kind of thing. <laughs> and this, I think, is also a real good advantage of Drupal. I think people who really love Drupal are like, oh, it's so great, I work on the site every day. But when you start talking about organizations where some of the people aren't as tech savvy, or people who are in low bandwidth environments who maybe only have a mobile device or can't access the internet as regularly, having email notifications sent out is really, is really slick. And the notifications module in Drupal is, is a good framework uh, that has a lot of different functionality for what's possible. So every group has that as an option and users can choose if they want it or not. Um, there's also an activity stream that uses the activity module, which I mentioned, that allows users who do come to the site but maybe miss something that happened to browse history the activity stuff is really smart. It'll work for a per group basis and a global basis. And I can sort of talk a bit about how it works for users in a, in a minute, but that's a part of the, the site. And then when you start talking about other sort of add-on features that groups would need, we have a really strong um, uh, calendaring and event system. So you can post individual events. You can get a feed out of those events. And there's now several different view displays of like what the events look like. So you can see week view, month view, this kind of thing. Um, and that helps to sort of coordinate, you know, people who maybe have a schedule that has several different groups of events. They can sort of see, see what kind of stuff they have. There's uh, also a, what's called core information on this site, but it sort of works a lot like the page system in Drupal um, and has, uh, to some extent, that sort of wiki functionality where you have a sort of set page and you can create documentation or you can create information. Um, and that kind of stuff, if, if you just want a really lightweight wiki style type of thing, you can sort of just turn on uh, a, a standard Drupal page, add some revision control to it, and maybe some filtering on like some markdown or other filtering to it. And you can actually get a really collaborative space. Only one person can edit it at a time, and it's got some limitations, but it's easy to set up, and it can work really well if you just want to say, hey, I'm going to keep 10 pages that reflect you know, our, these specific ideas, and people can update them and see who updates them. Um, and that's, that's just a feature on the site. There's uh, also a, um, a discussion system that is sort of uh, looks like a forum that allows for sort of a more interactive type of back and forth. Um, there is a forum module in Drupal, which does work for some cases. For this thing, we actually just took a, a normal sort of content type and just had comments to it, but they're threaded, so you can have actual sort of rich conversations. And they're actually th sort of themed and, and put into a view on the site, so it actually does look sort of more like a forum, this many replies, last replies kind of thing. Um, there's also a rich multimedia uh, integration. The uh, EM field, field, field module is used here. In Drupal 7, you could use the media module. And that'll support um, you know, sort of videos from third-party sites, audio from third-party sites. There's also the audio module on here if you want to upload your MP3, um, and uh, a number of other multimedia things that allow you to have those, have those assets Im inputted into the system so they can be shared or referenced or, or, or otherwise used on the site. Um, and then there's uh, you know, a few other sort of things that 
are helpful. There's a Twitter sort of is s system called Shouts. It's sort of a microblogging service. Hey, this is what I'm up to. This is what I'm doing. Check out this link. And that's really neat because it'll show up on the group, but it also will, will be broadcast out by email as well as, um, as pop up in people's activity streams. There's a, there's a sort of full news, news blog type of situation to see latest updates. Uh, and then there's a, a sort of lightweight task management system that allows you to assign certain you know, tickets to people and use it for anything to like manage new features on the website to manage writing a report or these kind of things. Um, and then there's a document library system I'll talk about as well um, that's also sort of cool. And all of these things you get to choose as a group administrator. Do you want them? Do you not want them? Uh, and so each group is sort of customized differently. So you'll see here where's a discussion thing. There's a block right there for discussions. If you decided you didn't actually want to have discussions, you turn it off, it would just simply go away. And that's, that helps. Each group is different, and this helps to customize it. Um, the document library is a feature that um, there's a lot of ways to do document management in Drupal, as well as other tools. Um, there's tools uh, like Afresco. It's open source. is a great tool for document management. Um, there's also ways to do it in Drupal that are really, really sort of slick. In this case, what, since documents were such an important part of the site, there was tens of thousands of them that we imported when we started, uh, we sort of built it in a document system for each group where you could actually upload the document and assign it specific taxonomy, uh, have comments against it, share it, have it be permissioned and version controlled and these kinds of things. Um, it's not a sophisticated document management system as something like Alfresco would be, but it works within the existing framework of Drupal. So you automatically get a notification when one's added. You automatically have your permission system. It shows up in the search and this kind of thing. Um, and so that's the kind of thing that ended up, you know, can be really helpful for sort of structuring a, a, a group that has a number of assets they want to manage. Um, there's also a, uh, a really powerful Apache Solar Search uh, integrated in the site, which is a total Drupal standard for any sort of serious search. Apache Solar is really neat if you do have a site that has a lot of content on it. Um, it'll work for internal purposes as well as external and respect access rules, which is very useful. And you can do everything from um, you know, searching the taxonomy and then filtering it to searching with inside a document or searching. Um, we even set up an uh, ability that you could search other Drupal sites if you wanted or had this, this site searched by other, other sites as well, which offers a sort of multi-site function, which is to so totally cool. It's also very fast and scalable, so it will, uh, you can use it without having the site sort of slow down. Um, but documents are, uh, can be a really important part and Drupal does an okay job of managing them, but a really good job of integrating them into everything else that goes on. There's also a, sort of the, the last really big part of the site is the ability for individual users to have their own profile and presence on the site. One of the sort of original goals was to understand that in a confederation of Oxford, you have 15 plus organizations. You do have people working on similar stuff, and you really want to facilitate the collaboration of those things. So there is this, uh, every user gets a profile that fills out the information about them, what they work on, what groups they're in, and you know, some other information on contact stuff. As well as you can see, uh, there's an activity stream for that user, so you can see um, what Pilar's up to, you know, you know, do things she's done, and get that kind of information. There's a, uh, uh, this, is, this, is, this is a profile that's obviously linked to anywhere the user comments or posts a document or shows them an activity feed. And this really helps to sort of expose people in the organization to other people in the organization that um, are, uh, are, are doing similar work or, or even relevant work. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you can sort of build. There's a, a friend system in place here, as well as a member directory system. So you can use a member directory to just sort of browse people. Hey, I'm working on a technology issue in Great Britain. You know, I could search and find someone like Joe, who I could then pop an email or, or, or sort of see what he's up to. Or maybe I'm working, you know, in, uh, you know in a different area with a different geography, and I can, I can sort of filter and, and sort people like that. When I find people that I like, I can actually go ahead and sort of add them as sort of friends or, or followers sort of to the, to the system. And then there's actually a sort of aggregated activity feed where you can sort of, sort of follow or see all the activity of people that are like you. So if you're a technologist in the organization, you can connect with all the other technologists, and then you can get a really, you can get their microblogs, you can get their documents. And you can really sort of get a, gooder, a bigger sense of what the organization does. And I think it's really important when you have a sort of geographically dispersed organization, but it would totally work if you're just in a, you know, have two offices or even a really big office and want this. Um, and Drupal does this really well. Activity module works with user relationships module to, you know, have this kind of integration and all works really well with views. And so it was pretty easy to, to sort of set up. Getting it, you know, useful obviously is a little bit of a chore, but, but you can check it out really easily. Um, there's also the ability to uh, customize 
your user experience, which we'll talk to a little bit of, of detail in a minute around the specifics of, uh, of a user dashboard. Not every user is the same, so they can customize their experience. But the sort of you know, overall goal of the internet site was to say, let's understand that we're working in teams and collaborating. Let's build functionality that's really useful for those, that, those groups. And then let everybody on the site have a profile and allow them to interact and, and work with other people. So that's sort of, sort of what all went on with the, the internet. And um, it, when it gets a lot of use, you can see a lot of interaction. And that's really cool. And it was not, you know, not to, it was definitely a lot of work to build, but it's leveraging so much existing Drupal technology that you can replicate this kind of thing relatively easily. And that's the kind of thing I think that made really is why Drupal works really well for folks, because these are all these use cases somebody has solved five different ways. You just can put them together like Legos and put a put a theme on it, and now you have a, a really cool site. So that's sort of the the high level uh, here in terms of sort of what's, what's gone on, public, private websites. Um, and I think we're sort of spend the remainder of the time uh, before we take some questions, which uh, we can sort of get into discussions around that. But really sort of talking about a couple of features we wanted to call it in specific as things that I think are, would be very useful to people in this room, and then show you sort of a, a quick Drupal recipe for how to do it. Um, it we're, we have some code and some modules here that will be in the slides you can download. So if you're not a developer, you could download it and send it to a developer and start a conversation around that. But I think it's sort of part of this is, is sort of technical, like what do you do to make this happen? Uh, and the other piece is actually more sort of inspirational or, um, or sort of what is possible, just to give people an idea. So I've got a few of them, and Joe's a few of them, then we take some questions. Um, and happy, of course, to follow up on any technical details later if people want at the conference around these things. So the first, uh, the first really technical thing I want to sort of highlight is, as I mentioned, users have the ability to customize their own experiences on the site. Um, this is something that uh, Drupal.org has, if you're on that site. Um, this is a slightly more powerful version of that. But the sort of, the sort of foundation here is this site is all built using a module in Drupal called the Panels module. Um, I'm a big fan of it. I think it's actually really good for Drupal site development, but I mean, you can do it either way. Uh, the, the specific cool part about panels is that everything in panels is sort of treated like it's, it's a called a panel pane, but it's sort of an individual widget. So like this section right here for events by region is a little widget that gets developed and built sort of independently. Um, it actually probably is using views on the back end to build this data set, but, uh, but it's sort of its own little, little bit. And then all the site, for, the, uh, for all the internet sites, all laid out in panels. So every, every element is a panel of some sort, and they have different permission rules and behaviors depending on where they are. And, and who's looking at them. But the, the cool part is that because it is in panels, you can actually do a lot of customization on top of it. So there's a button you'd see here that says customize this page. Um, and if you actually go ahead and click that, what ends up happening is you know, it sort of switches the view so it actually has sort of a, a more of an administration view. Um, this is only for this user and only for their specific functionality. But you can see, we'll blow that up just to see a little bigger. Um, you can see how. What used to look just be the content now has the ability to cr filter various settings for that piece of content to actually delete it. There's a little uh, uh, mover, mover, a mover bit that you can move it around to different areas, and then an add, uh, add new pane item so that you can add additional, uh, additional items here. So if you hit add, you actually get a, a sort of add modal that pops up and lets you have a widget library of there's some global widgets, there's some just, just for me widgets, there's some miscellaneous ones and some networking ones. Um, and that this is something that you know is, is sort of relatively new, rolled out in the site, but it allows for people to have that kind of customization experience. And you can do this for uh, as a developer, you can do this for a user homepage, you can do this for a group homepage, you could do this for any number of pages, um, and you could do it either for a per group basis, or per user basis. It's pretty flexible. The sort of the recipe here to do it, um, the you would obviously need panels module to do this, but there is ways to do this with the dashboard module as well if you don't use panels. Um, and basically, the way we had done it on this site was we use a module called Panels IPE, which stands for in-place editor. It's what actually lets the, the dragging and dropping happen on the front page. Panels node and content profiles say every user gets one of these panel nodes that, that they can configure. And then, you know, just you, when the user gets created, this function gets called to give every user a panel node. And then when you actually look at the home page, it calls this function or these, uh, these two lines down here to just show that page to users, lets them edit it. Um, so it's, a, it's pretty like, it, it, so I, I, I thought this was a pretty clever way to do this, but it lets you have a home page that's customizable per user by using content profile, and you can then define all the widgets to go in. I think that's cool. Second thing, uh, recommendations. So 
as I mentioned, there's a lot of need to try to connect people to other people that do similar things or groups that do similar things. And if you go on like various like social networks, they'll, Twitter will recommend you, you know, people to follow, Facebook will recommend you friends. And these are pretty advanced algorithms and they're what they are. But a really like lightweight way to do this is to build little widgets like this that you can put on your site as an internal site. So there's a, a recommended groups and people. But you could just as easily do this for document or activity or, or event or, or whatever you want. Um, so this is the sort of front end of it. The back end is really simple Drupal. It just says, hey, I already have views and taxonomy module on my site. Let's just go ahead and make sure we have a structured set of, of uh, like interests or categories to apply to different people. So I, for, I might be interested in Drupal, and this, this, uh, this other person might be interested in Drupal. And then the magic here is just to create a, a view of users that shows me all the users that have interests like mine. And uh, you know, that'll then theme it however you like. But that way you can sort of say, hey, like this user has five interests, show me some users that have similar interests. And you can actually then just display the result. And this is a pretty quick way to sort of go from, you know, hey, I don't know who else to connect on the site to, you know, here's a specific person you might want to talk to. And it'll actually show you which keywords match. So in this case, you know, these, these keywords actually matched this user, and that was really cool. So this is, a, is also a neat little recipe to set this up if this would be of interest to you. So that's uh, two from the internet, the two little um, tricks from the, the public websites. Um, as I mentioned before, because we are 15 organizations in different countries, uh, one of the tasks for the, the public website is to signpost people towards their, their local Oxfam. And so um, we use some clever little tricks behind the scenes to work out where in the world people are and then direct them to um, their local Oxfam to find out more um, about what that, what that Oxfam is doing or to donate towards that Oxfam's work. Um, if you're not in one of those countries, then you get a vanilla version of the same sort of thing, which allows you to choose from this drop-down box here. We'll go to the general donate page uh, where you can find out more. Uh, to do this, obviously, we have a lot of users on our public website, and so we needed some pretty heavy caching to make the website run at all. Um, but we needed um, the cache tool to be aware of people's geographical location. The standard cache tool just creates one cache for every public user, every um, anonymous user, which is no good for us. So we, um, wh what we did is we took, um, this is our little recipe of what we did, we took uh, one of the best cache modules that are out there called Cache Module. Um, we grabbed some free data, which is available from maxmine.com, which converts IP addresses to a two-letter country code. And then we, we uh, made some additions to the cache module um, to prefix everything that's stored in the cache with the, uh, the country code. It's very, very, very simple, really, all it's doing. Um, for the, the techie-minded, this is basically what's, what's happening. Um, if there's a country detected, then we just um, add on to the data that's being stored, the country code. Um, uh, and cache module um, uh, has some settings put in the settings.php file, which we're able to capitalize on and say, these are the only countries that we're, listed, uh, we're interested in, in in our list here. So we cache for 15 countries uh, only, and if you're not in those 15 countries, you get the generalized vanilla view. Uh, if you're in Canada, you'll have a slightly different experience because you're, there's also Quebec in Canada. The free data doesn't go down fine-grained enough to region, so in Canada we present data for both Oxfam Canada and Oxfam Quebec. Uh, second example, um, as I said, we work in, in uh, three different languages. And so something about uh, some language-aware content. Uh, the Grow campaign is, as I mentioned earlier, is our big campaign that we're working on at the moment, all about uh, food and food security. Uh, it's one of the highest profile things we've, we've ever done. As a result of that, um, it has its own um, brand being developed for it. Uh, the logo is different from uh, the current Oxfam logos. There's a color palette which is unique for it. Um, and some very uni unique materials being generated per country, uh, per, um, per language, the three public languages that we work in. And so uh, I very, very briefly mentioned early, earlier um, that we use three key modules uh, from Drupal Spaces, uh, Context, and Features to create these microsites, uh, which are all language aware. So in English, the Grow campaign looks like this. You have the, the header of the the site to tell you you're still within the Oxfam.org site, but everything in this section is uh, is different color palette, different um, fonts from uh, everything else in, in the rest of the sites. That's English. This is French. 
This is Spanish. And uh, so the recipe for that is, is this. Spaces basically allows um, certain things to be set apart as distinguishing this, um, this area of the site as distinct from everything else. Uh, allows you to override some of the, the essential variables in, in, uh, in Drupal, like the, the value for the home page, um, or you know, um, a whole myriad of other variables. Um, it does that in, in lots of different options. Uh, uh, an organic group can be a space, or a user can be a space. The way we do it is with the taxonomy module. A taxonomy term is the term for a space. So if something can be classified with a taxonomy term, um, which in Drupal 6 is basically any node, then that says this space is active. When the space is active, uh, the great thing about this is using features module, we can turn features on and off in very similar way to uh, the way Matt was talking about with the groups in the, the intranet. Uh, you can choose whether to have active certain features uh, and we can build whichever features we want. So we have a feature which creates press releases, uh, um, a feature which allows media contacts, a feature which allows key facts um, and uh, several others I can't remember at the top of my head. Uh, and then each space can choose to have these turned on and off. For the, th the three campaign spaces, they're basically identical, so they have the same features turned on and off. But as we go forward and have more, fe more campaigns using the same set of tools, we can say this campaign needs to have more documents, and so we have that feature turned on, and but it's not interested in, in media contacts, we can have that feature turned off. Um, we could even go down as fine grained as having um, a, a particular logo per space, which is which is really really cool. And because we can detect whether a space is active uh, with Spaces module very very easily, then we can do all kinds of things like adding CSS, JavaScript, doing lots and lots of theme overrides, uh, whatever we want to, to make that section of the site look completely different from any other section. So a quick little recipe. I think that kind of brings us towards the end. So I guess it's time for questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's. Yeah, I think uh, it's a common question for a lot of NGOs that I've talked to. Is how do you delegate um, responsibility for publishing materials? And it's something we've we've really struggled with. And historically, the way we've done it is we've had an English editor, a French editor, and a Spanish editor, and they're the only people who are allowed to put stuff onto the site, which has worked great. But it's main, you know, it's exhausting for them. Everything has to go through them. Um, as time's gone on, we've slowly delegated more and more material away from those three key people. Um, and essentially we've done that by training people to a certain standard. Um, I'm hoping to, uh, we are currently, and I'm, I'm hoping to push more towards um, delegating more, which I think will we'll do what you're, you're talking about. So already we have several different um, user roles. Each user role has a, a different level of access. They can, um, a different amount of things they can use per, per node edit page. Um, so historically, it's been very, very centralized through those three editors. We are slowly moving to delegate more, um, and it's tricky. <laughs> uh, well, um, Drupal has a really good user role definition system. Pretty much, uh, you, can, you can create as many um, permissions that can be granted per role, and then as a user signs into the site, then uh, Drupal understands what role they have. Um, and we, we basically use that all the way through um, to work out wh whether this user is allowed to create these kind of content, uh, pieces of content, whether they're allowed to create all the content or just put it into an um, um, edit editing um, workflow. Yes, yeah, we, d we, d we do it all. Um, we, we do translate as much as, as we possibly can. Obviously, it's, it's really important that it's... Uh, well, uh, the, um, all these, the sort of the framework elements of um, Drupal, including the menu system, all is translated through local module built into the to Drupal core. 
um, which does work very, very well, we found. Uh, well, we, um, um, the, the locale module allows you to de um, define which uh, languages are active within the system. Um, so we don't allow any uh, content to be put in that's not in those three languages. We don't publish in German, we only publish in French, Spanish and English. So if something arrives in Arabic, we put the PDF on in Arabic but with English text uh, in the CMS. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, it always has one in English. Uh, French and Spanish follow on whenever they get translated, which is usually pretty close afterwards. Uh, there's not much I can think of that's in, say, Spanish and not in English. Although, actually, no, in South America, um, South America and Latin America, um, there's a lot of material focused on those areas um, that is just in Spanish and not, not in English. Uh, we just omit them, yeah. Every, every, language, every page has a language defined and anything. Uh, so if you're, o if you're viewing in Spanish, you only see material that's in Spanish. At the back. Sorry, can you nice and loud? Um, well, I, you bring up the import. So the question is, uh, bespoke document management system in Drupal, the importing was from the Plone system. There was tens of thousands of, of, of documents that was, that was a little tricky. Um, in, in no small part, because things had changed a little bit sort of over the years. He had a few different versions. Um, the, so the, the second part of your question, answer the importing bit, we used a bunch of Drush scripts that actually would could have create individual Drupal document nodes um, on the fly or, or as part of the import script. So it would basically take the, take the dump from Plone, it would parse it, sort of do category matching, do uh, you know, sort of date formatting, and then just say, okay, let's go create a bunch of those, of those nodes. Uh, in terms of the actual system, I'm happy definitely to get into some of the details on it. The, the high level of it is there's a, there's a node type called document and a node type called uh, document folder. And you can create folders and, and reference uh, documents for them. And then uh, it's just a view of the documents that are in there. And you use a, there's versioning that's there, taxonomy that's there, node access that's there. Um, and then you can sort of you know, search or sort. And it's just treated like normal content. Um, it's not as powerful as, as like an Alfresco or some like higher level document management, but it does work with all the other stuff. So that's a, uh, a sort of good thing. So yeah, like uh, file field press views equal document management. Um, so that's about the amount of time we have. Thank you everyone for coming to the session. And there is, uh, there is this bit of surveys for sessions you've attended here. Um, if you like this kind of stuff, uh, you can tell the organizers, and next year they'll have more of those. So thank you, everyone. Enjoy your DrupalCon London. <laughs>